Thank you very much for inviting me. This is a great conference, and uh, the future of psychology in this area is incredible. What's going to happen over the next 50 years will be unbelievable. And you're just seeing some of the things here. The people who are going to talk will give you a preview of what you're going to see over the next 50 years. There's been a lot of progress in the last 50, but the next 50 are going to be the really important ones. Um, I have recently retired from teaching, and um, I have also just, just ended my editorship of uh, the journal Intelligence. So I'm embarking on a new phase of my career. As a journal editor, I had to be diplomatic and friendly to everyone. Now I don't have to be. <laughs> and I plan to take full advantage of that. So I find uh, myself um, in the position of Don Quixote. Uh, he wanted to restore chivalry. I would like to restore rationality. Um, and particularly rationality in, in the social sciences. So what I'm going to talk about today is education and why it hasn't changed. Um, in fact, it hasn't changed much at all in the last 3,000 years. Um, and the question is why? Now, if we look at other domains like eating, everything you eat today will probably be new to you or new to our species um, within the last, we're not eating anything that people ate 10,000 years ago. It's all been changed, either genetically or new things introduced. Um, so everything's new. Reproduction has been modified substantially. Um, with the advent of birth control and fertil fertility treatments, um, there is much modification that we're not even aware of going on um, with, with reproduction. Locomotion. I came over in a plane, uh, and everybody's complaining, oh, it's too crowded, it's, it's, the food's not good, everything's bad. They're at 34,000 feet in an aluminum tube flying to Madrid in eight hours from Atlanta. Um, if you'd done that same trip um, even 100 years ago, it would have taken you four or five days. If you'd done it three or 400 years ago, it would have taken you three months, um, and uh, a lot of people would have died. Um, it was not pleasant. Um, we've also had huge changes in habitation. Um, in fact, so, so many changes that, that many people say the average person in the developed world lives, lived better than 15th century royalty. So uh, that's changed. Commerce has changed. Um, as we can see, uh, if you've been listening, the Panama Papers, maybe you know that. I mean, they're offshore, all sorts of things, so accounting, re legal regulations, uh, it's, it's changed dramatically. But education, the only thing I can point to that's changed in education are books, that was a good change, a blackboard, it's not even black anymore, it's white, uh, and, and mandatory education, half in mandatory education, which, which was a substantial change. If you don't believe me, I have a few um, uh, pictures here from, the first one's from Plato's Academy on the left. In the middle, there's one, a German um, school in about uh, 180. And the, the third one, which is my favorite, is a classroom from 1350 which is approximately six, exactly 666 years ago. I want you to look at this one a little closer. Um, particularly, let's see, back here, you'll see people talking. You'll see a guy asleep here. Um, let's see, what else? Um, somebody who's uh, spaced out. All kinds of things that, that are completely familiar to anyone who's ever taught a class. In fact, if Plato walked in here today, he'd know exactly what was going on, and he'd probably be able to take over the lecture uh, if he had to translate it. So here's a modern classroom, not much different than what we see in 1350. Uh, somebody annotated this, 
Uh, this picture, I, I got it, and then I found the annotation later. Here's the, here's the annotation. You may not be able to read it, but what it says in the first row, people are actually taking notes. Here they're uh, browsing Facebook, Reddit, and here they're um, browsing participation. And then on either side, they're watching <laughs> So that may be the case. Uh, um, so those, the computers have not changed much. It's just changed the, the mechanisms by which, we, uh, by which we interact. In fact, what this picture was taken for, if I can go back here, was that this was actually an experiment where students were registering their level of interest in, in the lecture on their computers, and it was a, uh, which hasn't caught on either. Um, there's been so little innovation in uh, education, we, we need to ask why. Um, and it's because of the way it is. First of all, the focus has been on schools and particularly on teachers. Um, an enormous attention has been paid to teachers. In the U.S., and particularly mu much of what I say will be talking about the U.S., but um, I think it's probably true all over. I was talking to other people, and, and I think uh, you'll find maybe true of Europe. Um, the problem is that schools, including teachers, account for 10% of the variance in academic achievement. 10%. Um, and most of our attention is on schools. What I'm going to argue is that the focus should be on students, because they are responsible for 90% of academic achievement. Don't blame me, blame you. Um, now, I understand there are contradictions here. Uh, first of all, I taught for over 40 years. Um, but it did interest me how little I often affected students. Um, the other thing is I realized that I'm trying to teach you something. So it's up to you to get it, I guess, is what I have to say. So there's a contradiction in, in what I'm going to be saying, but, but it's supported by data, is the best I can say. Now, the best way to think about this, I think, is with a simple experiment, a thought experiment, that has never been done, interestingly enough. I cannot find anywhere in the literature where this experiment has been done. Um, you take 50 teachers, and you rank them for their teaching ability. And then take 50, 50 classes of randomly selected students. So each class is composed of 50 students, 1,000 students in all, 20, 20 students each in 50 classes, or 1,000 students in all. And then we're going to randomly assign teachers to the classes. Now that's condition one. That's the teacher condition. Um, the second condition is the the same 1,000 students, but instead of assigning students randomly to classes, what we're going to do is give each one an IQ test, and then rank order them by IQ, and make up the classes starting at the beginning. So the smartest students go in class one, the next smartest 20 go in class two, and so forth. And then we will randomly assign the same quality of teachers to these. Now the question is then, um, after they're taught for a year, you take a pretest and a post-test, and then after one year of teaching, you correlate um, the, the, the variable in each condition, x, with, with their achievement gain scores. All right? And here's what we'll, I'll predict. That teacher quality correlated with student achievement in condition one, the teacher condition, will not exceed 0.32. And that squared uh, gives you the variance accounted for, so it'll be about 10% of the variance. Uh, in condition two, however, we're going to see that, um, that the correlation will be up to 0.95. Uh, the variance accounted for will be about 90% if you square 0.95. Now, what I'm 
saying is not that intelligence will account for all this variance, but it'll account for a substantial portion of the variance. Other things definitely account for achievement, but those things are also associated with, student, with, with, with students. Um, so one way to think about this is anything that can walk away from the school, any variable that can walk away from the school is associated with students. Anything that stays with the school is um, get credited to the school. Okay. So um, that's a complicated experiment, but here's a very simple experiment that anyone who teaches does, and which, which I did on several occasions when I was teaching large sections of introductory psychology. I would take last year's final, and on the first day of class, I would give the students the final that I'd given the year before. On the last day of class, I would give them a new final. Um, and then I would correlate, I also had their SAT scores, which are scholastic aptitude tests, uh, which are used for admission to college uh, in the United States, or ACT scores, another similar kind of test. Um, so you give new students on, in, in your course um, last year's final on the first day, then you give them the, the new final at the end of the course, and then you correlate them both. What you will find is exceptionally high correlations, uh, all over 0.6. This surprised me when I first did it. People come into class with different amounts of information. Those students who come into class with knowing more learn more over the course of the, uh, over the, course of the semester. They do better in the course overall. They get the higher grades, and they also, um, uh, there's a stronger correlation with IQ, which makes a stronger correlation with IQ. So the correlations will be high. If you want to try that yourself, I encourage you to do it. So the question is, if this is true, why haven't people realized it? I think they have known about it, um, and there are several indications that they have. For instance, China, China's civil service exam was given from 200 BC, which is a really interesting test. It was um, a way for anybody to rise uh, and, and raise their family in social position by studying for this test, and some people spent a lifetime doing it. Um, it was very difficult to pass. People who passed it were given civil service positions. Um, another thing that indicates that people knew students were uh, important was a book by Juan Huarte, published in English in 1698, before that in Spanish. He was a, a a Spanish physician who wrote a book about differences in the characteristics of, of students. And then we have a long line of research with Galton, Binet, and Spearman who identified um, the characteristics that made students different. Um, another reason that schools are the most salient, um, so it makes students um, characteristics less obvious. School, uh, students go to school to learn. We blame the school if the student doesn't learn. Um, another problem is there's this fantasy that anyone can learn anything. Uh, it's sometimes called deliberate practice. But believe me, I started out working with intellectually disabled people. Not anybody can learn anything. There are differences among people. And uh, it, it affects what they can and can't learn. Um, the notion of equality that, that is common in the U.S. and, and developed countries also is um, in some sense foolish. Equality generally refers to under the law that every person should be treated equally. But to think that every person is equivalent to every other person is foolish. Uh, we are all, and that uniqueness is produced by a, a combination of genetic and environmental factors. But there's no one in this room that's equivalent to me or um, to anyone else in the room. You may have some similarities, but you're not equivalent. So people are different. Um, probably the, the, uh, the um, focus is on teachers currently because they're, they're the lowest in the hierarchy and easy to, uh, to look at. Here's the hierarchy that we're going to be talking about. 
and you'll see that um, students are nested in a long hierarchical chain of nested variables. Um, and one thing we need to be concerned about is something called endogeneity. Everything is mixed together. So when we study schools, we're studying a lot of things. And it makes it difficult to separate the sources of these variances. You, you have to do very controlled studies, and they're generally not done. Um, so when we look at schools, when I talk about school variance, it generally includes everything that's related above students. When I talk about student variance, it's everything not related. Um, but there's a possibility for endogeneity, so things are mixed up. Uh, when we look at a teacher, for instance, there's also classroom effects that can, that can be included. So it's a complicated issue, but it's not that complicated. Um, so what do educators think? Well, here's one educator's statement, uh, a cloyingly simplistic um, answer. What do you suppose is the most significant variable in determining how much learning goes on in, school, in a school or a classroom? What do you think has the greatest effect on the quality of education students receive? It is the teacher. Um, this makes me want to vomit. Uh, it's, um, this is the standard line of education. In fact, this was taken from a paper about the brain and education. Uh, I'm sorry to say. Um, here's another version that's, that's a little more focused. This is from a paper by Brewer, uh, 2015, and what the citations within the field of education and what they cited. And you won't find intelligence mentioned anywhere up there. Uh, the only thing that comes close is self-efficacy or, or motivation. And we'll see later that that's not particularly um, important. But uh, if you want to look at that, you can see that the individual differences variables that are most important to student achievement are not listed anywhere in there or even considered. So education um, is one of, the, one of the difficulties and the people who need to be convinced that this is wrong. Okay, first I want to look at research assessing the contribution of teachers to student academic achievement. So I'll always be looking at teachers' contribution as best we can assess it uh, related to academic achievement as assessed by some um, test. Um, or it could be years of education or a number of other variables that, that stand in for uh, academic achievement. Um, the first, most of these studies you probably haven't heard of, which is a shame. Um, uh, some of you may have heard of a few of them. How many of you have heard of the Coleman Report? No one, please. Okay, the Coleman Report was um, released in 1966. It was um, probably one of the largest studies of educational uh, achievement uh, ever conducted. It, it was related, it was, um, mandated in the U.S. Civil, Service, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation in the United States. Uh, and in Section 402, they said that there would be a national study to look at differences among schools, um, and particularly they were interested in segregated schools versus unsegregated schools. Uh, as, as you, I'm sure, know, um, there was huge, at this time, there was huge segregation in the South. Um, black students went to separate schools. There was a, uh, a rule endorsed by the Supreme Court, separate but equal. That is, you could have separate schools as long as they were equal, but they certainly weren't equal. Um, this is about the time I started my graduate career, a year later. And my wife actually had, uh, had a job starting one of the first um, integrated preschool programs, and segregation was really um, something. You, if you weren't in the South at that time, you would not appreciate what, what segregation was like. I lived in the South, Alabama, and uh, for instance, we rented an apartment, 
and we went to look at the apartment the real estate agent showed us and um, we liked it, we we're gonna take it for all we could afford. And so the, real, the, the person who was handling the real estate um, said, well, come down and we'll have a talk. And so I went down, had a talk, he took my money, we had the apartment. My advisor later told me he wanted to make sure you were white. That's why he had you come down, it wasn't. A, so some of it was very subtle, but other, others of it was blatant. Now, obviously, what was expected is that, that they would show great differences between black schools and white schools. This was an extremely extensive study. It included 4,000 public schools, 645,000 students. Um, it included half a grade one and three, six, nine, and 12, grades three, six, nine, and 12. So from primary to through secondary education. There were ability tests, intelligence tests, there were academic achievement tests, and there were surveys, extensive surveys of principals, teachers, and students, so they could assess the contribution at each of these levels. Now, the interesting thing that this report, they finished the study, and, it, and it's quite an impressive study. Uh, you can find it online. Um, I think Google Books, it's a very long report, uh, well documented. And it was released on July 4th, 1966. You may not realize why this is an important day, but that's what's called Independence Day in the U.S. It, it's a celebration of the Declaration of Independence, and it's a big national holiday. Everybody goes to fireworks. And, um, so they released it on that day. Um, and they obviously did it to avoid publicity. Um, what happened was that when they analyzed this, teachers accounted for 1% of the variance in academic uh, outcomes. Uh, schools accounted for 10 to 20 percent. There were some differences across schools. Um, but what they found was that whites were the most segregated group. And it's still true that whites are the most segregated group. People of European origin are generally the most segregated. Um, other, other racial groups tend to come in contact with other races more frequently than, than um, Europeans or Americans of European extraction. So the conclusion from the Coleman report was that most of the differences were between students within schools uh, and not between schools. There wasn't that much difference between schools. Even these horrible um, segregated schools where um, black kids would get the white kids' books after they were finished with them um, there, were, there was no substantial difference. Okay. There have been a numerous follow-up studies um, of this, and one of the most important was uh, Jenks, Smith, Auckland, Bain. Um, it was the most extensive, um, and it was, uh, there are books um, that have been written by Jenks particularly, and it upheld the results. It supported the results of the Coleman Report. What it said is that 10% of the variance in academic achievement is due to school, so to schools, and so teachers must be less than 10% of this amount. Um, a, recent, a more recent paper uh, follow-up reviewed 40 years of data from developing countries, and what they found is that average per capita income in a country is greater than $16,000 per year um, schools account for 10% of variance. So in any developed country, schools will account for 10% of the variance. In less developed countries, Hanneman, Han Hanneman and Loxley um, found that developing countries could be anywhere from 10 to 40% of the variance. And the reason for that probably is um, that there are multiple options in developing countries and differential accessibility to, uh, to education. So those account for the differences in the, in the proportion of variance that schools account for. Um, another one uh, has done a more recent, has taken a more recent look at this and claims that even in developing countries now, there's been sufficient development um, that the, uh, there's declining proportion of variance attributable to schools. One of the studies I really like is uh, 
I think an important one. This was done in Warsaw, uh, Poland, where, and published in Science, by the way, if you want to look at it. Uh, during World War II, Warsaw was completely destroyed, completely destroyed. And um, it was rebuilt under a communist government. And they decided that they would do something useful and that they would rebuild it according to a communist ideolo ideology. So there would be no, uh, there would be essentially random assignment to people within the community. Um, so what they actually did was assign residents randomly, and it, was, it worked fairly well. Um, the, the IQ of people who lived in urban areas was slightly higher, I think 106. Um, and they found that there was a slight tendency for smarter people to be closer to the center of town, but it was a, a small one, and, and they could control for that. But, uh, so they, in 68 districts, having 208 schools, they tested 14,238 students, and they tested them on the, Maven, uh, the Ravens matrices, and they also obtained parents' education and occupation as indications of the person's social status. Now their, their hypothesis was that they would completely eliminate the effects of social status on, on educational outcomes. Um, that is, no longer would there be differences across, uh, across classes. Uh, here's the results. They, they, this graph shows the social class index um, on the y y-axis, and um, the Ravens matrices scores on the x. This is group data. Um, so what it shows is that the correlation between social status and, uh, and educational outcome, or the Ravens score, was 0.98. Um, they didn't ach uh, obtain standardized uh, educational achievement measures, um, but we know that the Ravens is highly correlated with out outcomes. Interestingly enough, they, they were successful in the sense that schools only accounted for 2% of the total variance. Um, so much of the variance you see among schools has to do with um, residential patterns we find in most developed countries. Uh, still some forms of segregation. Uh, now, does this apply in other situations, uh, particularly at colleges and universities where students are accepted? And, um, there's a very interesting uh, study by Angoff and Johnson um, that I think is great. What they did in, in the U.S., um, you have to take the SAT. It's a standardized test given by, uh, run by ETS, the Educational Testing Service. And so they went back into the files and dug up 22,923 who took the SAT, and then four to five years later had t taken the graduate record exam, which is what students take to get into graduate school. So a lot of students take it, um, and they were able to find 7,954 students in 292 colleges or universities where there were more than 10 students in each of these universities participating. So they had uh, uh, nearly 300 colleges with 10 or more students in each of these. I think the average number was 29. And then what they did was use the SAT math score. The SAT is divided into two major sections, math and, and verbal. Uh, and the math is more flexible. If you look at teaching, it has a greater effect on math than it does on verbal abilities. Um, so they wanted to look at what would be most uh, amenable to teaching. And then they used um, the, the SAT math, the, the person's major, uh, the gender, to predict GRE math, graduate record exam math. So this is four to five years later. And what they found was a correlation of point, R squared of 0.93. That means that only 7% of the variance is uh, attributable to, to schools. I'll let that sink in a minute. Only 7% of the variance is attributable to schools. Um, so no more than 7% could be uh, related to teachers. Has to be less than that. What this is saying is that it doesn't matter where you go to college. 
it doesn't make a bit of difference where a student goes to college. I mean, we can think of some scenarios where it might make a difference. What matters is how smart that student is. And that student will do equally well at any college in terms of academic outcomes. Doesn't matter where you go to college. So, in fact, uh, how you can tell if a college is good or not is not by looking at the college, it's by looking at the students they teach. So a major component of any college rating will be the SAT score, at least in the United States, the SAT score of the average student that they admit. Um, this takes a while to sink in. Uh, it, it's, you know, any student can go anywhere um, and end up with the same educational outcome, just about. And it makes sense. We're using the same textbooks, teaching the same general material. Now you say, uh, hey, if I go to Harvard, I'm going to make more money than anybody. Um, uh, so it, it, you know, it may not change my academic achievement, but it'll change my life outcome because I'm going to make a lot of money. Not true. Not true. Um, there are some economists who have taken a very close look at this, and they've been able to get people's SA, or college SAT scores and looked at graduates of colleges, specific graduates, and been able to get either self-reported income or income retrieved from the Social Security database, which keeps, a, keeps track of all reported income over a person's lifetime to, to establish Social Security benefits. And what they find is that when you take away the mean SAT of a college, uh, differences in salary disappear. They're just gone. So if you go to Harvard, you won't make any more money than somebody who went to uh, um, Case Western Reserve if you have the same SAT score. Um, so it can be a selling point if you... <laughs> uh, there is an exception. Um, and that exception is minority students and students from low SES homes. And that is, if you're interested in that, it's fairly, um, uh, fairly heavily discussed by Bowen and Bach. Um, what they claim is that people uh, from low SES homes and minority students are able to, to establish social networks that, that are useful to them um, in, in these uh, more uh, higher rated schools. So, but in, term, in general, it doesn't make a difference where you go to college. A point that's hard to, to uh, believe. Now we'll look at some more specific um, tests of, um, of IQ and intelligence and how they differ. This is an interesting study that I like a lot. Uh, it's Steve Petrill and his group. Um, and what they, they looked at were twins in the same or different class. When anybody who's done research, I'm sure, knows that um, twins are sometimes, there's, there's some doubt about how they should be treated. So sometimes people have the philosophy that the twins should be individualized and, and should be assigned to separate classes. Others say that they should be allowed to be in the same class. Um, so about half of them are in, assigned to the same class and half are assigned to different classes. And uh, so what you find is that um, when you sort out the twins, and these are like 13,000 twins in the TED's sample, uh, you find that those who are um, uh, in the same class have higher correlations than those in lower classes. And so, um, Betwe the difference between these correlations allows you to estimate the te teacher's contribution, the classroom contribution, to, and that is 8%. So a teacher cannot contribute more than 8% to, um, to the, the outcome in academic, academic achievement. Okay, there are some direct measures of teachers' effects on academic achievement, and they've just been recently um, uh, published. Um, the first one's by Chingo and Whitehurst. Uh, 
And what they did was look at 10 years worth of academic achievement in Florida and North Carolina's school system. Uh, in Florida, they, they go from grades three to eight. In North Carolina, three to 12. And they've got a decade's worth of grades for these people. And um, the, it amounts to 23 million data points over the decade, 2.3 million data points per year. So it's an ex extensive um, data set. Whitehurst used to be Secretary of Education, Grover Whitehurst. So I suspect that he arranged this so he'd have a nice data set to analyze when he left the, in the secretary position. Um, so what happens? Well, here's one of the best studies looking at the, the decomposition of, of variance. And what you'll see is um, that up here, from here to here, it is either student variance or control variance. By control variance, they're talking about things they control for that are associated with a student, things like has free lunch, um, and uh, sex, gender, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, the other kinds of things are just associated with the student and they don't know what they are because they don't include intelligence in any of these things. So um, in this particular case, uh, let's see, what is it? The student, uh, the, the student, no, the teacher accounts for about 3%, 4% of variance, I guess. So it's this little chunk up here. Idea of how effective teachers are. Um, effective is probably the wrong, wrong word. I'd say powerful. How much they're able to modify um, outcomes in terms of academic achievement. Um, there, there was another one done. This one was done on math. And the next one, this one, is a little cleaner. It's done with fourth and fifth grade students. Uh, and it, it includes both math and reading, and you can see that in this one, here's the, here's the chunk. But you still find that these two pieces of the pie, which are the student pieces of the pie, add up to 90%, all right? So, oop, didn't do that. Okay. So there are other difficulties with teachers that, that, have, that are seldom addressed and that are beginning to be addressed. Uh, one is that teacher training is ineffective and expensive. This floored me when I saw the studies. Um, it costs in the U.S. about $18,000 a year to train a teacher, to, to provide teacher training. And in the U.S., very often there, there are days off that teachers get for training, for you know, professional um, service training. They're, they're, it's not effective, uh, although it's very expensive. Um, the second thing is that teachers reach maximum effectiveness in, in five years and then level off. Uh, and they do it with or without additional training. So people have looked at uh, the differences uh, in, in educational research and, and know this. Um, the, the other thing, another thing is that good teaching has low persistence. So you teach people things, they learn it, and then how long does it last? Well, three quarters or more uh, is fading in one, one year. So it, there's a fade out effect um, that most of us are familiar with. Um, teachers generally have among the lowest SAT admission scores in the US when, when you look at the, the mean admission score for teachers, uh, I, there are only a few occupations that are lower. Agriculture, I think, is one, but most of them are, are quite low. Um, I don't, yeah, well, I won't. Um, when people do randomized control trials, as the Department of Education did, for educational interventions, which are quite expensive to do, they show a very low success rate, fewer than 9%. So it's very hard to come up with, with any strategies that improve academic achievement. All right, let's summarize what we've said so far. First of all, schools account for 10% or less uh, of outcome and academic achievement. I hope I've convinced you of that. I've only presented the very 
top of the data. There's much more that, uh, that could be presented, but I don't want to test your patience. It's probably the case that teachers account from 1 to 8 percent of the variance in academic achievement. And I'd say much lower, in fact, I'd say probably not over 6 percent, but probably even less than that if you have a well-designed study that, that controls for all the, the confounds that can occur. And um, it is true that teachers are the most important to academic achievement if students are ignored. So if you ignore students, it's perfectly permissible to say, I'm the most important. In fact, that's what I would represent to your dean. <laughs> that I'm the, the, I can show you that if we just consider what's going on in school, I'm the most important thing. You better pay me well. Um, but if we start considering students, then the, the picture is much different. All right, if not teachers, then what? Well, students, obviously, I've already spoiled the surprise. Um, so th is there any evidence that student characteristics are actually related to academic achievement? Um, I'm going to give you a, a study here of several studies that support this fact, although these are just, the, again, the top of the iceberg. There are huge numbers of studies that have been going on for forever. Deary, Strand, Smith, and Fernandez um, tested themselves, <laughs> no, not themselves. They tested 70,000 English school children on cat at 11 years old. This is a cognitive abilities test. Every child in the English school system was given a cat test. And then they were also given the GCSE at age 15 or 16, four years later, four to five years later. The GCSE is, um, I'm glad, glad Stuart is here. General competence, competency in secondary education? General certificate in secondary education. General certificate in secondary education. OK, thanks. And so it's a standardized test that tests sub, your students in various subjects. They were able to find, uh, since, it, since students can pick out what tests they take, uh, it makes it sort of difficult to match up students. So out of the 79,000, they found, found 13,248 that had taken the same test, and another cohort, slightly smaller, that had taken another set of tests, they agree. And so what they did was then, uh, oop, um, correlate, they, they took the tests here and formed a um, latent variable. Uh, these are the uh, academic achievement tests. These are the intelligence tests. And so you have a latent variable for academic achievement and a latent variable for uh, cognitive ability. And the correlation between them is 0.81. Now, one thing you should notice here, if you're familiar with uh, this kind of model, you'll notice that uh, the EM theory was a bit cowardly and he was a double-headed error. He wasn't willing to say that intelligence causes Um, I think he probably has uh, views on that topic, but, uh, but um, he, he took the safe path. Uh, we'll consider that issue later. So what this shows is a very high correspondence between the latent variable of academic achievement and um, intelligence. These are replications that appeared in, intelli uh, in Intelligence, the journal, on um, two batteries of tests that each offer uh, a cognitive ability test and a um, academic achievement test. Um, Kaufman and Woodcock Johnson are the two batteries. And you'll see up here that you'll find the same thing that, that Deary had. correlation between those were um, averaged about 0.83, um, just as in the Deary study. So there's no doubt in very large studies where there are lots of subjects that there's a relationship between um, academic uh, achievement and cognitive ability. Um, 
Lynn has found the same thing holds on a country-wide basis. That is, if you take the average um, estimated country IQ um, and correlate it with the TIM scores that they achieve in the fourth and eighth grade uh, in math and science, you'll find very high correlations when corrected for attenuation and even good correlations uh, later. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but uh, there is some research on the direction of effect, the, the, the arrows, uh, that seems to suggest that the arrow should be um, cognitive ability to academic achievement, not the other way around. And these results are mainly obtained in um, what's called cross-lag panel correlations that I won't describe in any detail because they've been criticized methodologically but suggest that. But there is other data that suggest um, uh, that, that abilities are not changed by practice. So the question about does doing a, a cognitive task increase your intelligence, the answer is no. Um, Randy Engels produced a lot of research. I programmed a cognitive ability battery and spent hundreds, probably thousands of hours taking cognitive ability tests, and I only felt dumber after I did it, not smarter. So if anybody does this kind of research, you, uh, uh, it won't make you smarter. Um, okay, oh, in this particular study, I forgot, uh, it it's, has to do with musical ability, and they were really looking at this notion of, of um, practice and, and its effects. And basically, what they found was that even after huge amounts of practice, um, skills, basic skills did not change. So um, that's one area. Uh, but this is, this is an issue that's going to be uh, debated, I think, for some time. So summary, teachers account for less than 10% of total variance in student academic achievement. Um, teachers account for 10%. Students account for 90%, plus including error of measurement. So they probably account for less than that. Um, so intelligence accounts for more of the variance in achievement than any other known variable. Uh, meaning that it's important to understand intelligence if you're ever going to understand um, academic achievement. It has to be understood. There's no doubt about it. We have to be able to understand intelligence to understand academic achievement. And how are we going to do that? Well, there are three ways. Um, where will this understanding come from? Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about this. Many of the papers in this symposium will address what's happening in these various areas. There's, but I'll make a gross prediction right now. Um, it's going to be genetics, neuroscience, and cognition. All three of these are going to come together because they have to. Genetics affects the brain, and the brain affects cognition. So it's a, change, a chain that has to be um, understood completely. It's not going to be easy, but it's go the, the results will be stupendous. Um, uh, they, they really will be. And we're, we're on the threshold of doing this now. Um, let me just give you one study that, um, to illustrate this. Uh, this is by Plowman's group, um, and it includes 13,000 twins, uh, a general certification, uh, I got it here, of secondary education, GCSE, the same thing we looked at before, um, multiple student characteristics. He used intelligence plus eight. You will seldom find studies that include intelligence when they're looking at some of these other eight things. This is the first one I've seen really do it well. And um, he found that intelligence predicts 34% of the phenotypic variance. So intelligence, 34%, that's a correlation of about 0.6, maybe a bit low. These students are 16, I think, when he did it, 17, I don't know. Um, eight others predict 28% of the variance alone without intelligence. So the things I'm going to show you only predict 28% of the variance when you leave intelligence out and let them do as much predicting as they can. 
When you put all nine together, they predict 45% of the variance, so these other eight add about 11% of the variance. This just indicates how important it is to understand intelligence if you're going to understand academic achievement. Um, here are the, the graphs, and what you see on the bottom is intelligence. Okay, so this is um, encouraging for intelligence, but there are some other things. Together, these things account for about 75% of the genetic variance, and so there's still some understanding to be had here. Um, in neuroscience, there's a PFIT model that is, stands for um, posterior, posterior Frontal Integration Theory, which has made some contributions to understanding where intelligence is functioning in the brain, and it's getting better. I'm not going to go into detail about these because I think other people will. In, cognitive pro in cognition, models of cognitive processes um, are becoming um, uh, more elaborate, and I think they'll become more statistically relevant. Most of you uh, may know that many of the models of factor structure that we have were just invented de novo from somebody's head. They were, there were never any factor analyses done. And um, uh, Johnson and Mouchard were the first one to really test these in, in models. You need large data sets and um, there's going to be more of that done, I think, and we'll have a better idea of what these processes were. Working memory has, has been shown to be a re really substantial part of uh, the variance in um, intelligence and in uh, academic achievement. Uh, the stability of intelligence. This supports the argument I'm making. Intelligence is extremely stable. Um, Deary and a bunch of other people who's, who've worked with him have found that uh, intelligence is, is stable across a 70 year period of life. Um, substantially stable, amazingly reliable. Okay, so putting it all together just to finish up, uh, I am not saying intelligence provides immediate answers for education. It doesn't. Um, but there are things that we can do now that we know about. First of all, make sure that high ability students are identified regardless of, uh, of SES. And then G by E interaction. We know that it's important for a person with high ability to be in the right environment to develop those abilities. It's common sense, but it's supported by, by behavior genetic research. So that's an easy thing to do, and Plowman has written a book with a co-author uh, saying just that. So what I am saying is that without understanding intelligence, education will not change. So in another 666 years, when we come back here, if we don't understand intelligence, it'll still be that picture of the 1350 classroom. Uh, if we do, um, other things will change. And the way we can do that is to concentrate education research dollars on students where research shows the largest effects. Um, some people might advocate higher, which higher advocate says we'll get a smart pill. Um, others of you may have other ideas. We may understand the cognitive architecture well enough to design um, efficient programs for learning. But there are a lot of things that can be done and I think need to be done. But if we're not rational about what's going on in this situation, nothing is ever going to change. Thank you. <laughs>